Good morning, everyone. Oh, no. Oh, yeah. Oh, There we go. I think we're good? We're good. All right. Good morning. Good morning. How do you want to do this? Yeah, I saw that you're repping with a shirt. It made me happy. I did, yes. <laughs> yeah, uh, my, both of our schedules and our badges said this was the main stage. Yeah, so, so sorry we're late. If you have any friends that are there, let them know that they're in the wrong place. And that it's okay because we were also at the wrong place. <laughs> we almost fought for it, too. Yeah. The Guild Wars folks there, and we're like, whose panel is this? Are you sure? <laughs> Smackdown backstage. Yeah, it almost happened. <laughs> So welcome, welcome to our uh, Saturday morning-ish, near noon-ish uh, critical role panel. Woo! Glad you guys could join us. Uh, who here hasn't seen the show? Yeah. Awesome. Oh, great. Fantastic. So careful of spoilers. Somebody's back it up. <laughs> Sorry, I just assume that's what follows that sound. <laughs> uh, yeah, so we're a, we're a show of a bunch of voice actors that sit around, roll dice, and play Dungeons and Dragons like the long-term basement nerds we are. It's awesome. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, that that's pretty much the show. We just once once a week, usually on Twitch, we'll get together and continue the game, and. Uh, People show up and watch us, and it's really amazing. I don't really know how it happened, but you guys are incredible, and the community that's come out of this is continuously blowing me away. So, uh, yeah, a round of applause for you guys. Woo! <laughs> uh, I don't know who did it. <laughs> we got mood lighting now. Heck I yeah. know. And the ominous countdown in the corner. I know. <laughs> <laughs> have we have to solve this puzzle. <laughs> so if we have that going like, beep, 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 the 24 sound, yes. the whole panel, that'd be great. That would be terrifying. So I have to start with intros. Mary. Hi, I'm Mary Elizabeth McGlynn, and I had never played Dungeons & Dragons until uh, Matt asked me on to Critical Role, and I play a tiefling warlock named Zara. And Woo! yes. <laughs> And I have two kill shots, one on Rhyme Fang, poor sucker, and, <laughs> and a beholder, much to vexes. I vexed Vex. Yeah. With two kill shots, Laura Bailey is very mad at me. It's her birthday today, so get on board and tweet. Actually, it's Liam and Laura's birthday today. Yeah. So tweet, 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 tweet them. Yeah. The twins' birthday. Yeah, that's actually how they came up with the idea to make their characters twins, was because they share a birthday. It was like, well, that's convenient. Yeah. So I'd never played Dungeons and Dragons. I had no idea. I've taken a lot of theater and I didn't realize, I think I was kind of intimidated by it because the kids I knew uh, growing up were really, um, they, they kept to themselves, you know, and they were this really quiet, shy group and I was a bit louder and with a, a louder group of nerds and they were a quieter group of nerds and, and so we never really crossed borders and they played D&D &D all the time and I was like, I don't know what that is, it's kind of freaking me out a little bit until I realized it's just improv with dice rolling to see how well your improv goes and I thought, that's brilliant and these were probably the most creative people I could have known, and I didn't get a chance to know them, and now I, I, I do. But it's, I just love the idea that it is one of the most creative things you can do. And what's come out of it, the fan art, the fan shipping, all the stuff that's happening. And Cash and Z are not an item. Let's put it out there now. But we have built Tumblr trash. Yes. <laughs> Yes! <laughs> but how long, I mean, first of all, to watch this guy in action, it's just amazing. I mean, unbelievable. Amazing. And I've, I've been directing Matt for years, and I had no idea. I was like, oh, I'm so intimidated to direct you now. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's a weird reversal. For most of my life, it's been like the, oh, don't let them know you play Dungeons and Dragons. <laughs> how long have you been playing? Oh, man. Uh, I've been playing since my freshman year of high school, so 20 years this year. Wow. Yeah. Wow, wow, wow. I've been playing longer than some of you have been alive. <laughs> oh, oh, God. <laughs> I know. What was the first character you rolled? That hit, that hit me harder than I expected. Uh, <laughs> it's true, though. Yeah, it is. Terrifying. Um, 
first character I ever made because I was invited to the game and I didn't know much about like the logistics of it, but I wanted to be a wizard because magic practitioners, it sounds like a really cool idea. And so I made a wizard, the second edition D&D, so I had to learn how Thacko worked. Um, and I, I was like, okay, what kind of wizard can I make? Oh, they're kits. And your kits are kind of ways you customize your character. And so I was like, oh, militant wizard. I get to wield a sword and be a wizard like Gandalf? Cool. Little did I know it was the most useless kit ever because <laughs> wizards back then were so just dead if you didn't have magic ready. So if you get up with a sword and go, ah, you're dead. Uh, so it wasn't the best idea, but, it, you know, it was fun. We played it for a bit. But my uh, DM at the time was not the best DM and... After we played for a few months, I got really frustrated with the style, and we had one crux moment during a game uh, that got me so frustrated, I just left and decided, I'm going to DM my own stuff now. <laughs> I, I know there's more to this. It can be better. <laughs> yeah. And I really haven't played characters much since. <laughs> so you've been, you've been DMing that long. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I've play, I played in games, and I've, I've played a lot of other systems as well, but d and is kind of where my heart is just because I'm a... I'm a big RPG fantasy nerd. Yeah. You know, How are you liking 5th edition? I love it. Yeah. I love it. I think, uh, you know, I really enjoyed 2nd edition because it was all I knew, although it had its quirks. Somehow everyone had 18-100 strength. Everyone was really lucky when they <laughs> rolled their character. Um, but the math was ridiculous. Uh, but, I had, but I had such depth to it. And 3.0 3 and 3.5, I felt really, really good ways to allow cu character customization. Um, it did tend to complicate aspects of combat, or at least, you know, cause a lot of floating modifiers and the math kind of, while less esoteric math, yes. <laughs> based around the AC and Thacko uh, equation, uh, it, it did lend to a lot of kind of everyone paying attention to, okay, and then you get the plus one from here, and this gives you plus one to hit and damage from the bard thing. Oh, but you have this bless spell on, so it's another plus one to hit from there, so I'm going to plus four... Uh, oh, but you're also turned away. I just, is it a plus? Uh, I just start bleeding from the nose. <laughs> um, it explodes. <laughs> yeah. So, like, you know, you made it work, uh, and it was better than previous editions. And then the fourth edition came out, and that was a struggle at two certain points. Um, I, I ran a long-term fourth edition game, which my friend Sean actually played in here. Uh, uh, yeah, we, we, we had a great job. Actually, Sean here, if you guys were watching the... Um, the the game we did the other night, we had the Q&A, he was the rogue in my Ravenloft campaign for two years that ended up taking over the castle after Strahd. Uh, awesome. And <laughs> cut out the bard's tongue and turn him into his own private Theon. Oh! Uh, at the end of the game. Yeah, it ended a real happy ending there. It was uh, <laughs> Ravenloft. <laughs> Sang with a lot of vowels after that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> But, uh, but yeah, fourth edition, it, it had some cool ideas. I love the skill challenge aspect of it. I felt the idea of the, the at-will magics were, you know, magic practitioners never actually ran out of spells. There were some low-level stuff that they could just do forever. It was really great and useful. Because as a wizard, I never want to have to go, well, I'm out of spells. Yeah. You know, you shouldn't have that. You shouldn't have to be able to only, pick, you know, mage hand three times a day. I'm like, no, I don't want to pick up stuff. I trained for years in this shit. Let my book float to me. Yeah. Um, so uh, the fourth edition, you know, at will magics carried over as the cantrips in fifth. And so they kept that over, which was really nice. Yeah. The skill system was a little more refined. And the fifth edition combat and just character development, it still allows a breadth of you know, customization with your character, but not overcomplicated. And I really, I just feel that like they streamlined it in the right ways. And I'm really, really enjoying fifth edition. I think it's a core. Yeah, cantrips are awesome. Cause I, I realized as a warlock, I'm like, oh, I, I get three spells and that's it. I mean like three, that's it. And yep. boom, okay, well. Uh, uh. Yeah. <laughs> to, be, to be fair, those three spells kind of yeah, really. They're, they're pretty good, yeah. pretty good. <laughs> pa pack a punch there. Come on, how many, how many hit points did Rhyme Fang have left when I did the Hellish Rebuke? It was like six, Yeah, right? was, he was pretty much down to the end. He yeah. was down, so Laura could have went on him and it would have been, he would have been dead. Yeah. It was just, I got lucky with the timing of my turn. Yeah. That's it. Both times. Both times. <laughs> <laughs> Happy birthday, Laura. <laughs> That's, that's one of the things I love about this, this game in general, and any RPG and system, is everybody who grew up as a kid playing in their front yard, kind of, you know, fighting windmills like Don Quixote, you know, we all had that period of time where we kind of embraced our imagination and just made up stories and went with it. And as we grow up, society tends to have this 
trend of pushing that thought away of like, no, you must be a realist. You must not play. You must not be able to to get together with people and just be creative for the hell of being creative. And uh, RPGs are one of the mediums that continues to allow that to flourish long into adulthood. And I think it's such a wonderful therapeutic and and positive way of reinforcing social connection with people. Yeah. And, and I mean, I've built stronger bonds to the people I've game with than most anybody else in my life. And there's something about that shared adventure experience that's so wonderful and, and those memories are real, you know. Yeah, but your world building too and your memory building off of these characters. I look up, I mean, these are some of my best friends in the world or play Critical Role or on Critical Role and after a while I forget that it's Laura and Travis and Sam and Liam and I'm just worried about how the hell is Scanlon going to get out of this stupid dragon, you know, <laughs> and Grog is being is on the chain flying behind him and, and Vex can't fly fast enough on the broom and if he lets go, I mean, it's just, these are massive concerns about these characters <laughs> that I've really come to love. And it's like, I've, I let go of the fact that I'm stalking my friends online. <laughs> and because it was a real conflict for a while. I was like, is it weird that I'm watching my friends every week play this game? And, and I realized it's it weird. wasn't. I know it's weird. <laughs> Why be normal, right? You know, but it was sort of amazing. And I'm just so in love with these characters. I'm so glad that Pike is back. You know, it's just... Uh, yeah. We've never been so torn about promoting a Friends television series. Yeah. Like, go watch Blind Spot. Yay, Blind Spot. Hopefully it'll get a second season. <laughs> You're like some kind of wizard. What do we do now, Elf? Actually, I am a known cleric. Now. So I keep praying, like, move Blind Spot to L.A., you know, yeah. so she doesn't have to go back to New York. <laughs> yeah. So we can put write a petition to blind spot to set the show in LA next season that'd, yeah. be, that'd be great if y'all could help we, us with that that would be really that. great <laughs> uh, well uh, part of this uh, since you, you kind of know the gist of it so far let's go ahead and open the floor to questions we'll turn this into Q&A we have a microphone there's a mic there so if you guys want to ask anything go ahead please. and line up behind that microphone and we'll start taking your questions one at a time we'll get through as many of you guys as we possibly can as you can see we have a looming 48 47 minutes uh, left 47 47 make a wish <laughs> <laughs> all right Sal what's your name uh, my name is Connor hello there it is oh there we go Screw it, I'm loud. There we Yay. go. Be loud, Connor. Be loud. I will. My name's Connor. Sometimes people call me Tiffany. Don't ask why. Hi, Connor Tiffany. Hi. <laughs> uh, so my question, a uh, bit more of a serious one. So there's so much stigma around uh, games like d and and role-playing and stuff like that. To, that society sometimes te tends to exploit that nerd culture with shows like Big Bang Theory and whatnot. <laughs> 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 I told you it's a serious question. No, it is, and you you definitely tug the tug the cord there. <laughs> you you invoked that which should not be invoked. <laughs> Continue. <laughs> it's okay. No, it's necessary conversation. The Kraken is awakened. No, whereas now there's like uh, a show like Critical Role, which features, if I may say, a charismatic cast of people that are authentically playing. The game. <laughs> so I think I've heard your grace is back. No. And, uh, <laughs> yeah. So how do you think this is going to spread within the next? 10 years where, you know, these types of things start to become more popular culture, where they start having followings, niche audiences, like with Twitch, it's a great way to get out, you know, 20, 30,000 views per episode, stuff like that, live streaming, you know, do you think it's going to keep progressing in this area? Do you think, you know, it's going to become like, you know, an actual television series, something like that one day? What are your thoughts on that? I don't know. <laughs> We're still kind of holding on as to what this show is. We did, had no idea this was going to become whatever it is. You know, we, we, we had like a six to eight week plan of like, well, if it doesn't work out, we'll just go home and keep playing on our own. And people found us and resonated and started creating their own games. And it just kind of built this, this community that I never expected. And it's become so much more important to me than just the game we play now. It's, it's introducing other people to it and watching them create their own stories with their friends and send us pictures of their game nights and their families playing now. And I don't know, to me, it's, it's D and D has an unfortunate stigma because of when the time it came out, there was a very like uh, anti D and D fundamentalist Christian movement that didn't understand the game, just saw surface elements and decided that it was evil demons being summoned. And it's like, my people, I apologize. Oh no, it's okay. No. <laughs> my people too. I look, my family's off in the south as well. I, f I fully understand. <laughs> so don't, 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 don't think you. I got to carry that burden just yourself. Um, 
Um, but uh, so that that put a stigma on it, and the media, of course, ran with it as it does. Uh, so yeah, it, it got off to a bad start. But I think now, through you know, geek culture becoming pop culture for better or for worse, I think largely for the better. Um, it's now you're now seeing a trend of people that grew up playing D and D. Who, want, who grew up writing stories and making up stories with their friends are inheriting the entertainment industry. They're becoming the producers and the writers mm -hmm. and the directors of films, television. And so that's part of the reason we've had this big surgence in geek culture is because now the people that are creating the media are the geeks. We yeah. took over. Yeah, we did. It wasn't the meek shall inherit the earth. It was the geeks shall inherit the yeah. earth. I mean, it really is. And, uh, and so as far as to, to, to your question there I, I'm not sure where it's going to go I think it's cool that it's bringing it to an audience that didn't have the opportunity to really understand it first there are a lot of people out there that would love to play RPGs but like Mary said you just didn't really know what it was and there was a weird uh, between the stigma or just intimidation you didn't think it was something you could or would want to do and so through these shows a lot of people message us almost daily saying since I watched your show I went out and bought the books and started a game with my family or with my father and we reconnected through it and like it's, it's become this really cool uh, reemergence of tabletop gaming and thanks to other shows like high rollers and like the real role play guys and you now the dice camera action that wizards does like this there's this trend now people showing other people what D, &D can be and other RPGs as well, like Zach, who used to run our stream, is now doing his you know hyper RPG go up in Seattle, and they're doing a bunch of awesome uh, Shadowrun games and uh, all these different other types of RPGs as well. So, will it end up mainstream media? I don't know. I know there's people trying it because whenever <laughs> anything seems to be doing well on the internet, that means all the executives in a room somewhere with a bunch of suits have to be like, "How can we recapture this and make money?" Yeah. Um, so I'm sure we'll see some attempts at that. Some may be genuine, some may not be. I think the charm of our show is the fact that we're just a bunch of doofuses that like each other a lot and play for our own amusement, not necessarily to, you know, make maximum dollar for a company. And uh, as soon as that gets introduced, it kind of gets a little weird and, I don't know, the flavor gets a little tainted for me. So um, I think as long as people are genuine and they're producing this content, it'll still resonate with people. So we'll see how the entertainment industry treats it. Um, I know we're putting our feet in the ground, making sure that, you know, it doesn't fall into that category because I would rather jump in front of traffic. Yeah. <laughs> I also feel like it's sort of starting to change the, the whole idea of adulting, you know, of what it is to be an adult and you have to be straight and serious and everything else. And it's just like and that combined with the Internet and everything in this sort of isolationism that that causes, that this is now bringing people together again in a social environment to be creative. And with cutting of funding in schools and everything else, I feel like we're sort of losing Using that creativity and, the, and that idea that, that we are here to, that's one of our main things as human beings is the power to create, you know? And uh, especially, I, I just think it's an amazing thing. And, and I think it's, you know, it's bringing people together and bringing this out of the basement and into the light and making it cool. And that it's all right to, to, to now talk to people again and not just sit on your phone and tweet anonymously to people, you know? I mean, to be fair, it's thing. okay to go back in the basement for those of us who don't like light. I'm yeah, that's fine. I'm not a fan of sunlight myself. Basement's cool. <laughs> yeah, nothing wrong with that. But still, go out and see the stars. There's that no is, light. Yeah, go look at the stars. Yeah. Gotcha. Well, thanks for coming to MomoCon. Hey, thanks for having thanks us. Thanks for Good having question. us. Yeah. <laughs> thanks, Tiffany. We love you. I think it's working. Hi. 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 What's your name? Hi. Stephanie. Hi, Stephanie. I just want to say thank you for uh, bringing Critical Role into my life because it's amazing. And I'm pretty sure into everybody else's life that's here. So uh, I just wanted to uh, thank you uh, personally and also congratulate you guys personally for 50 plus episodes of thank Critical you. Role. <laughs> <laughs> and so my question is I'm sorry, I'm shaking. <laughs> it's okay. Um, <laughs> my question to uh, you guys, um, which is your favorite character in the Critical Role wor world? Okay. Oh. His favorite character in the Critical Role world. <laughs> What's his name whom Percy goes to to get ammunition? Victor. <laughs> Victor! Victor! 
The fact that who watched the birth of Victor the first time? I mean, come on. How, where, it just came out. That's what scares me. <laughs> I don't know where it came from. That was, that was a purely improvised character that has uh, become like a staple now. I know. And I'm so afraid every time you go back to him, there's going to be less and less of him. <laughs> there's a good chance. <laughs> you know, when you're like the only individual that has discovered black powder really in the universe, mm -hmm. and that's kind of your personality, yeah, you're, you're not going to be very careful with it. Yeah. Um, we've already seen him blow up once, though it was non-canon. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, Victor, Victor is an interesting one. I'm sure he'll show up again. <laughs> yeah. They're also unique, though. I mean, everybody's got such wonderful personalities. I love the way that Vax and Vex play off of I'm a twin. So to see them play off each other, like, yeah, they're totally twins. You know, it's <laughs> it's kind of amazing. And Sam Regal is just a bloody genius. You know, I don't know where that stuff comes from. And same place Victor came from. I think. Yeah, I think so. And Travis. I, I, I mean, who doesn't love Grog? Oh, my gosh. I was sort of scared, though, with Craven Edge. I thought for a while, I was like, Bacon might take our, our, our Grog, and I don't want that to happen, you know? Yeah. <laughs> and there's still the skull. There's still that skull, though. Isn't that skull? Yeah, what happened to that skull? I don't know. Where'd that skull go? I know where it went. I know. <laughs> <laughs> How far in advance do you plan where they're gonna go? I mean, this world that I mean, I, it's I don't I don't plan where they're gonna go because I don't know where they're gonna go. I plan possible places they can go. You know, yeah. I try and I try and prepare enough to the point where I'm not completely lost if they make random choices, but it still happens occasionally. <laughs> um, but yeah, for me, it's about just considering what their discussions have been in the game, listening to what their characters have you know, insinuated they might want to do next, and then I'll flesh out those avenues that they might possibly go so that when they choose that path or this path or this path, I have some things prepared for it. Um, like, did you have the, the acid river prepared when you knew at some point they're going to get on that rug? And <laughs> no, that, Sorry, I know, it's a very painful the wound. Acid, the acid know. river had nothing to do with the rug. The acid river had everything to do with Will Wheaton being a guest <laughs> on that episode. <laughs> Okay, why? Okay, so you're unaware of this. Uh, <laughs> Will Wheaton used to play on Acquisitions, Inc., which is the, the PAX Prime live game they did with the official D&D &D folks. And he had a character named Eofel, who uh, died horribly in a pit of acid during oh. one of the games. Did he always roll once? Of course, it's Will Wheaton. <laughs> yes, okay. <laughs> and uh, and it, it, it became like a thing. Like, he just was really distraught that his character died straight up and was gone for good in this acid pit and the internet of course let him know hey man your guy died nasty he's like i know and he gave this whole long post about like the the eulogy of afl and it became a thing and so acid pits in him a very sore spot so of course when i had the opportunity of having will wheaton play my dnd game i couldn't not do that yeah uh it also just unfortunately happened that the rug got in it and i was like oh Oh. Yeah, and you know, magical enchantments can resist certain things, but uh, that's not one of them for a, a tapestry. Yeah. <laughs> oh, oh. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's hard for me to pick a favorite character. Um, I really enjoy playing as an NPC. Uh, I mean, Gilmore's Gilmore. a, yeah, a lot of fun. I was just going to say. I love, I love, the two NPCs I have the most layered are Gilmore and Allura, and I enjoy playing them both for different reasons, because they're both very, very layered characters. And you guys have probably only seen, you know, elements of those two, um, and I hope more of that plays out in the future, but both those characters are two that I really enjoy kind of jumping into their shoes for a bit, because it's, they're both very, very close and personal to me. Thank you, guys. Thank you, good question. Thank you. <laughs> Hello. Hello, what's your Hello. name? My name is Erin. Uh, I'm Somtree on Twitch oh, and very cool. also Twitter. Boom. And my question is, do you guys ever watch past episodes? And if so, which one have you watched the most or have you most enjoyed? Um, I, I've watched them all. Um, I watch every week with you guys. We flew in on Thursday night and I, you know, we, we landed at about 10, 30, 11, and I'm in the car going, I can find it, I can find it on Twitch. It's there it is, you know, and the Q&A was going on and stayed up till two and watched Percy. And then I was like, I can't watch, I have to go to bed. So I'm live tweeting with you guys pretty much every week if, if I'm available. Um, I loved, uh, I loved the Will and Cash episodes. I thought those were really fun. Yeah. Um, I wish we had been there to see Pike uh, die and be brought back. Yeah, that was intense. <laughs> 
I remember hearing about it, Laura. I was just like, oh. Yeah, last week I was like, what is wrong? Just this is intense D and D. Because you guys used to play how many hours a day? You would do like these marathon sessions. Well, yeah, because you only play once every like four to six weeks, and so we'd play for a standard like eight hours or more sometimes, yeah. depending. Full Saturday. You know, because we wanted to get as much time as we could when we got the, you know, the dads away from their kids. We have like a very short window, like, all right, maximize time. Then um, we'd all go home and just drain. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Worth it. Uh, but uh, yeah, so as far as your question is concerned, uh, I've, I've rewatched a lot of them, partially because I have to go back and, <laughs> it works as a good note taker as a DM to have like the actual episode <laughs> online. I'm like, what? Who did they meet again? Yeah. What NPC did they talk to? Oh, crap. I'm looking up. <laughs> okay, there we go. What did that character sound like? You know, so it's been a helpful tool for me to have that video. Um, uh, there have been times where we'd put episodes on in the background when we had to leave our bird alone for a while just to, like, she'd hear our voices. Oh, and kind of be comfortable for her. Which was your bird's favorite episode? Yeah. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> She's a bird. <laughs> um... <laughs> Yeah, we uh, we we found ourselves putting this couple episodes on and then sitting down and then end up like watching a full episode. Mima should be like, "Oh, we're those people." <laughs> we're like, "Oh, we watched a full episode of our own show that we already did." Ugh, ugh, ugh. It was a good episode, though. <laughs> uh, yeah, the one I've watched probably watched the most just because I love the reactions to it would have been the uh, the conclave attack. Mm, yeah. <laughs> That was so good. Yeah, it was. Man. <laughs> Holding on to that for two years. Whoa. <laughs> then stuff is going to go down. <laughs> uh, I can't wait to see it. Oh, man. <sighs> for me, it's probably cows. 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 Cow- that, <laughs> that was amazing. Was amazing. Let me tell you, seeming messes up everything <laughs> in the best way. Mm-hmm. Thank you so much. All right. We have a few people back there. We'll try and try and make these answers a little more concise. Yeah. My fault. Sorry. Hello. Hi. My you name can is Andrew. tilt that up if you want. Oh no, just the just the mic itself. Yeah. There oh. you go. Appreciate it. I'm tall. Hi Paul. Hi Paul. What's up, man? No, I'm, I'm Andrew. I was you're saying, angry. Because oh. <laughs> I had to adjust the mic. Oh, you're tall. Hi, tall. I see. <laughs> Sorry. My question is mostly directed at Matt yeah. because yeah. I'm kind of an aspiring voice actor, but I'm kind of coming up here asking as a going to be a DM and game designer. Oh, very cool. Wow. And so I was hoping one thing I'm kind of trying to figure out is with, I got a game in the works here, but the thing I'm trying to figure out is how do I help it to where I can help players begin, to where they can just set up a character in maybe like 10-15 minutes and just go. Have there been systems that have been fairly welcoming? There are many systems that, that are a lot faster in character building than D&D. d and is a fairly deep system. It's not super deep. It's not riffs deep. It's not, you know, <laughs> it's, oh, yeah, yeah, um, You know, the, but there are other systems that are a lot faster. Uh, some Savage World stuff can be pretty fast to put together. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, if you look online for fast, you know, fast character generation RPGs, especially on, like, uh, RPG Net. Uh, they'll have a lot of examples there. I can't think of any off the top of my head right now. Dungeon World. Dungeon World. There you go. That's one. <laughs> yeah. So, like, uh, those are all great systems. If, if it's d in particular, you can also uh, pre-create characters, like generate a character per class. If they're, like, it's their first game, they don't know what to do, and instead of having them build it, you can have them pick from the list and then, like, tweak and customize a few things if they want to and then kind of introduce them to the game. That way you've kind of taken the the weight off their shoulders. I've done that for a few people where I like create their character for them in advance and they'll show up and be like, okay, I'll pick this guy. And like, cool, go. And the other characters just go away. <laughs> or I make them NPCs. Why not? Um, that's my recommendation. Appreciate it. No worries. Good question. Thank you. Good luck with the voice acting. And good luck with the DMing, dude. Yeah. Okay, I'm, I'm much shorter. Hi. 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 Um, my name is Harley, like the motorcycle, because people end up calling me Haley. Hey, Harley. Reason. Like Harley Quinn. <laughs> Harley Quinn's more what I went. Yeah, yeah. So that's <laughs> what I would go to. So a lot more people that I know apparently know the motorcycle and not Quinn. Yeah, fair um, enough. So my question is, is how do y'all come up with the voices for y'all's characters? Because that's always interesting, because each of them have different accents and the ways of speaking. Zara was easy for me the minute I said Zara. I was like, well, that's her voice right there, you know? <laughs> Anybody who's got a name called Zara, you know, and she was very sort of in that. And I'd been working on, I'd been doing, uh, 
the female crusader for Diablo 3 and for Heroes of the Storm and I loved I loved Johanna and she she was a bit a bit more street but I loved that vocal placement and then so I really didn't even know what Zara was going to be until we started the show and then uh, and that's what the voice was and it just sort of came out of that and my obsession of the moon and the stars and everything else so I thought I'd, I'd start with myself because I didn't know anything else uh, especially about this world so I, when I was building her I just said well I'll I'll have her be obsessed with the moon and everything else because that's an obsession I'm very familiar with so uh, I started with me and my own likes and I think uh, trying to figure out what I want to roll next, you know, and uh, I w would love to hear you talk about the bard, uh, this new, uh, the conductor, maestro. The, the maestro. Yeah, sounds really cool. But the, anyway, so short answer is Zara, <laughs> and that, thus came her voice. Yeah. You know. I spent a lot of time alone as a kid. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. Um, for me, especially from a DM standpoint, it's considering sometimes character regionality, or some some races might have kind of you know kitschy themes through them. Like the dwarves, I tend to go Scottish. Not all of them, but just because it's classic, and I will always make an excuse for myself to do a Scottish brogue. It's my favorite uh, dialect ever. <laughs> it's bu it's oh, I love it so much. It's like music horrible discord music <laughs> uh, what was the game that you were talking about yesterday with talison talison directed you oh, in the, the game uh, i'll keep a strip yeah yeah they uh, th uh they had me do uh, uh the foreigner voice which was a voice setting you could set for npcs in the game and in the japanese version the foreigner voice is american and they couldn't do that and talison was like whatever accent you want to do that's not american so i'm like all right <laughs> this is your foreigner um, which is great because you could set the voices to uh, like little moe cafe maids, like a little cute anime girl. You enter and it's like, "Hello, would you like a tea?" <laughs> I love that story so much. And uh, uh, as, as such, I think everyone should play that game for that reason alone. <laughs> um, but yeah, for, for me, it's just. You know, what works for the character, what sounds different and unique so they stand out against each other. I've made a lot of characters in this world, and I don't have that many voices, so you know it's hard to kind of differentiate a lot of the time. So I try and find ways, whether it be through texture, timber, uh, vocal patterns, attitude, accents, attitude, it's huge, physicality. You know, I mean, Gilmore. The minute you, the minute you, you do that, I mean, that's Gilmore, right? <laughs> He doesn't need to say a word. It's just all of a sudden he's there. It's amazing. It's just it's physicality as well. I think that also in, for me as a watcher and really enhances the, yeah. the characters. Being a dragon can be a dragon. Yes. Oh, but that being a dragon <laughs> can be a dragon. You know, so Not anymore, Rhyme Fang. No. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. all Good question. Thank you. Yeah. Hello. There we go. Hi. Hi. Hey, what's your name? I'm Nick. Hi, Nick. Hi, Nick. Uh, so, quick question. Um, uh, you guys go to like a ton of different places in Westrum, who's like the main continent, right? Uh, uh, Taldore is the main continent Taldor, right now. Yeah. Where's Westrum? That's the, uh, sorry. That but, the but Westrum is a town in central Taldore. Gotcha. Yeah. So in Taldore, um, you guys go to tons of different places. My question is, do you have any deserts in there? Everywhere it gets colder and colder. Like, <laughs> It's cold one way, and then you go north, and it's colder now. Are there any deserts or like hot places? On Tal'Dorei, Tal'Dorei is a northern continent. Oh. Um, it starts to crest. I mean, Othansia is much colder, uh, which is the other continent that has Vasselheim. That's where the Slayer's Take is. That's mm -hmm. where the um, the Fire Ashari exists. That one's even further north, and that one's most of the time covered in snow, or at least some level of cold, cloudy weather. Um, and the northern parts of Tal'Dorei, like Whitestone, and uh, the uh, where Craghammer is, those are a little more snow covered. But yeah, it's a colder continent by nature. It's more of like the European type uh, time or climate. Uh, Marquette is a southern continent. That's where Ancarel is, and that is a mostly desert continent. Uh, it is probably seventy percent desert covered. Uh, so yeah, that that. If ever they go there, that'll be a very different uh, scenic and cultural experience than what they've encountered at all in the campaign thus far. Cool. Should be interesting. Thank you. <laughs> no uh, worries. Could we hear McCree or the Black Powder Merchant? <laughs> <laughs> Either one. I'll do you one better. 
It's high noon. Yeah! Hey, huh? my time? My time is it? I don't know. Noon? No, it's three o'clock. <laughs> there you go. Thank you. Woo-hoo! So good. <laughs> so good. Wait. <laughs> Hello, my name is Rock McKickass. Hey, hey kick ass. My friends call me Ryan. Uh, first thing I want first thing I wanted to do is uh, thank you on behalf of a friend of mine. He's running a Pathfinder campaign and when and when you did those tips and tricks videos on Geek and Sundry, I showed them to him and it helped him immensely in running oh, the campaign awesome. a lot smoother. That's great. Also, uh, just a plug for a friend. Uh, I've finding time to do more tips and tricks has been difficult. Um, I'm trying to get into a new batch soon. But at the same time a good friend of mine, Matt Colville, who's a writer at Turtle Rock has gone further than I ever could as far as outlining really detailed uh, videos on world building and running a game and running encounters. So uh, if you're like, oh, Matt, there's no more GM to this. I'm like, there's a guy who's doing a much better job than me who's doing a lot more than me. Go watch his shit. So uh, his stuff. Sorry, family panel. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, Matt Coville, check out his videos. They're really good. Anyway, back to your question. Uh, my, my question is, uh, what was the most difficult thing you've had to do as a DM and how did you end up dealing with it? if you did killing a player is always a difficult thing yeah. I've done it in a few games and uh, it's not a fun experience but it's an interesting experience from a narrative standpoint and uh, you know d d is, a, is a, a fantasy world and there are things that can reverse death um, and d d and sometimes it can be later in the game a little too easy to reverse death in my opinion that's why I introduced kind of the skill challenge Ritual for Resurrection in my game and take an, take an element of the skill challenge from 4th edition that I liked and convert that to the idea that not every soul can be recovered. You know, whether they themselves accept their own death or whatever entity holds sway over their immortal soul takes them before the ritual can, you know, that's kind of the, the challenge in that ritual. And the, the players, their actions in that ritual uh, essentially represent them trying to facilitate or reach out to their soul to stay and to come back to the body. Um, but every single time I've had to kill a player, it's hard because this person's put so much energy and time into this and you're essentially not robbing them of it, but circumstantially they're losing it and you have to be the person to agree to it and tell them they're gone. And it sucks and it's hard and people go home sometimes crying and you're like, what have I done? Yeah. <laughs> but conversely, that mourning process and that, that acceptance, one, it's a fresh start for them to create something they've always wanted to play before and the story implications of losing a hero really really continues to guide how tight the rest of the survivors are um i i had a game once again sean was in <laughs> uh where we had most of the party killed in a battle with a bunch of ghouls and, and this one campaign necromancy had been abolished for so long that it was just a myth no one believed that undead really existed, or if they did, like, it's more of a wives' tale, and it's oh, grossly exaggerated. And their first time into the shadow fell, they go into this tomb, and they walk into a room with a bunch of ghouls, and I think it was uh, uh, some sort of an undead knight. And they're like, oh, what the hell are these things? They're just like kind of nasty looking people. All right, we'll go and each take one. Well, ghoul par- <laughs> three people paralyzed later, uh, they just converged, and oh. Sean, uh, being the smart person, his ranger grabbed Chloe, the rogue, who was like screaming out, trying to help them, and says, "No, we have to go. There's no way we can win this." And dragged her out of the tomb Dude. as they watched the three other party members be eaten alive by oh. the ghouls. Oh. And it was like, "What are you gonna do?" <laughs> welcome, welcome to the Shadowfell. <laughs> 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 so yeah, that, that's definitely the hardest thing for me to do is to, is to notify a player that their character is dead. Good Thank question. <laughs> Spring break. Afternoon. Uh, hey. My name's Jeremy. Um, Hi, Jeremy. Uh, Hi, Jeremy. I guess this is a question for both of you. One is a fan and one is person running the game. But where do you hope the current Critical Role campaign ends? And based on the suicidal tendencies of your players and friends, where do you actually <laughs> think it's going to end? It's this. There's a fine line between suicidal and brave. I, true, true. Very I like to lean some. towards that they're brave. <laughs> With the toe in suicidal. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Big toe. Very like a little, toe. little dip. Um, I... Unless they make some real serious mistakes, because here's the thing, a TP, for TPK to happen, 
they have to not be able to acknowledge their mortality. Most TPKs happen in games because the players are assuming they're going to win or they're just not being careful and they just rush in and be like, if we keep fighting and keep fighting, oh God, he's down too. I, I know if I keep fighting, I'm the only one left. If I keep fighting, we're dead, you know, <laughs> then yeah, it's going to happen. But like, like Sean, that could have been a total TPK if his character wasn't like, okay, we're not going to win this. The, any chance we have of recovering this party, some of us have to get out of here alive. Run. You know, as long as somebody does that, there are opportunities to try and retrieve maybe a few of those people, you know, because of resurrection magic and such. And there's always the wish spell. You can always quest down the road. Part of an adventure for a while could be to find a way to find a being of enough power to be able to wish a friend back to life. That's a classic fantasy trope. And that's a really worthwhile journey. I mean, that's, you know, go to the underworld to seek a friend and bring them back. That's that's as old as there's been written word. Yeah. You know, that that's it's that's Greek old mythology. Gilgamesh days in Greek mythology. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. So, um, uh, yeah, I forgot the question. What, uh, <laughs> where, where do you want to... Right, okay. I, I think they have about a, about a year, about a year of story left before they finish the biggest arc of the story. The next step beyond the Chroma Con plane, because that's... <laughs> oh, Thordak the Cinder King, like, I expect them to be probably around level 17 or 18 when they get to that, maybe earlier, depending on how brash they are and how careful they are. Mm -hmm. um, but there's other things brewing in the world of Exandria. Thank you. There's that spinning marble of death. I don't know what that's about. I don't know what that's about. What is that about? Let's put all the survivors on top of it. What yeah. could possibly go wrong? What could possibly go wrong? <laughs> Just touch it. Just touch it. Kate Grog, go, go on, grab it. Shh. Don't tell them about the marble. Don't tell. It's a good marble. It's good. You want it? Uh, Hi. Just a failed ritual. Hi. Hey. I'm Amanda. Um, Hi, Bush. I was um, wondering, um, first of all, thank you for the hours and hours that you spend doing Critical Role and preparing episodes for us to watch every Thursday. So thank you so much. Woohoo! And my question is, um, I'm trying to start my own campaign at my school, but, and it's really funny because it's a liberal arts college, so you'd oh, think cool. that there'd be a lot of people into it, but they keep turning away like, oh, that's not cool. And so I was wondering if you would have any tips as to how to get people into D&D. &D. Because I'm trying to, I really want to do a game. <laughs> uh, have you ever seen that scene in Clockwork Orange? With the, uh... <laughs> <laughs> no, um, you know, that, that's the hard thing. It, you can't force someone to want to play an RPG. Um, you can always find ways to show them that it's not what you think it is. Been a, and if not Critical Role, there are other shows out there as well that might fit to them. But I think that's, that's part of one of the reasons we did this show was we felt there wasn't enough media out there that represented just friends having fun playing a game that was, you know, entertaining to people. And so we hoped it would fill that, you know, gap for some. And, and so we've had a lot of people that have messaged us saying, well, I showed the show to a few folks and they were like, oh, this is it? That looks like fun. And so mm -hmm. if that's a way you can do it. You can always pass around episodes of our show or one of these other great shows out there as an example to be like, no, 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 it's just friends around a table goofing off and improvising. Um, also ale. <laughs> <laughs> um, Bring beer. <laughs> aside from that, yeah, it's just, it's the way you, ex you gotta explain it. I've, whenever anybody says, what is Dungeons and Dragons? Like when you've asked me at the beginning, what is Dungeons and Dragons? What is it? I'm yeah. Like, uh, it's, communal storytelling and improv yeah in a fantasy setting it's like yeah. lord of the rings but you're just making it up as you go that's how i describe it it's like i'm watching my friends make up lord of the rings and it's you know and with dice so there's math which sucks but <laughs> but that's good too you know i mean you need math so it's uh it, it hits so many different levels it's kind of amazing yeah what would you as, as an outsider coming in originally what, what what do you think would be the best way to describe it to you if that's not it um, it, that was it to me. It was just mm -hmm. like, uh, and I, I, it, it was, it's improv. I mean, it, it was improv. It's come and play with your friends. We're going to, we're going to, we're going to go into, you know, Rivendell. We're, we're going to create, you want to be a wizard? You want to be a, you know, what do you want to be? You can be with anything you want. You get to choose who you want to be and we're going to play and just create things and see what happens. Thank you so much. Sure. You're welcome. If that doesn't work, send them to me. <laughs> hey, nice to see you guys. You as Mary, well. Mary, I saw you yesterday. Yes, Hope I know. Hope to see you tomorrow. Come. Uh, you're an autograph signed. Do it. Uh, 
My question is, what has been the most interesting something that a player has done in the game that was totally random that you never thought would happen? Cows. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, man. Seeming an entire party into cows <laughs> to try and, and masquerade as, and to at a certain extent interrogate cows as cows. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Varying sized cows. Yeah. Seeming messes everything up. I'm going to keep putting this out there. I love it. I love it. And then having to then chase down a rock, mm -hmm. so cast fly on the cows. Yeah. So you have a party of different size flying cows mm -hmm. across the moonlight. It's everything you hoped Amgen would have produced. Yeah. Uh, it's, oh my god. That was weird. Yeah. Oh man, now, I've, I've had some strange things happen. I've had some surprising things happen. Uh, I think really... I'm, just, I'm sorry. It's not because you're in the room, Sean. I have to keep picking on you. <laughs> sorry. But no, uh, the, the, when, you, when you cut out Jack's character's tongue was one of the most unexpected player things to ever happen in a game. I know, I know. He had it, he had it coming. Uh, so yeah. this was one of your regular players, yeah. and you cut out his tongue? Yeah. You don't know that no, 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 no. <laughs> I don't... How, how did he adapt to this new occurrence? <laughs> well, how well did the young Greyjoy adapt? <laughs> Not yeah. very well. Uh, no, well, well, for him, his his bard character was was a Vistani and was this very kind of like somewhat slimy, charismatic, in that I can't possibly trust you, you know, kind of ringmastery kind of way. And eventually, he just got fed up with it, and the corruption had set in so strongly, he just cut his tongue out, and so. Jack played it as this now freaked out and then subservient, quiet, and you know he Leon. yeah he would he would express his stuff through character action and describing what he was doing emotionally, but couldn't actually say it. So wow. like I, I bow my head and nod and look directly in his eyes and give him a look of intense hatred, but then look away and walk. And I'm like, all right. <laughs> Yeah. This got real. <laughs> That's the other thing I love about it is that you have to say yes. It's like if you get out there and, and you roll a 20 or whatever and it's to, you know, against someone else and they're like, don't you have to meet? It's like, I rolled a 20. It's like you have, you have to say yes yeah. or you have to leave. Yeah. It's like, it's great. So it sort of teaches you like you have to deal with the shit you you know, put out in the world and everything. It's yeah. consequences. Yeah. And think too, like like in a lot of games, if one player had cut on another player's tongue, like that would have been a really, really tense, like angry, real people being angry. Like, you can't do that. That's bull crap. Then, you know, maybe. Or you could take it as a really interesting character moment mm -hmm. and do what Jack did and play it into the personality. And now that's a reason for the now, you know, the mute character to be silently plotting against the person who did it mm -hmm. or try to find a way to get their tongue back and their comeuppance against that player and that in itself can be a really cool arc as well I don't promote P PvP <laughs> in your games unless your players are really like into the idea and respectful of you know continuing the narrative because that can go really south very quickly uh, if you're not being mature about it but um but yeah that's right. one of the so weirder thank ones. you and just saying you also a show did inspire me to go down to the gaming room downstairs and play my first game of Dungeons Dragons ever Yay! Awesome. Yes, what did you roll I decided to go with a half orc barbarian named Thok that I like to do the voice for yeah, yeah! <laughs> thank you guys that's awesome that's so cool hello hello hi my name is Matt. Uh, Hi, good Matt. strong name. It is a good strong name, yes. We've had this I see you play Bloodborne. <laughs> so, uh, I've, I've been playing uh, mostly Pathfinders, but a couple different RP RPGs for a little while now. I don't get to play as often as I like. I've been very blessed to have some very good DMs. Awesome. And we just had a bit of a perfect segue talking about how 20s can make things happen. Well, I want to ask... You know, there's those instances where a series of 20s and 1s tend to make something go hilariously but horribly wrong do you have any experiences like that like you know kind of an example we turned fallout into risk <laughs> <laughs> there's a lot of ones and 20s okay like, hey. wow. <laughs> yeah i mean that's what i like about ones and 20s and like i while in the system technically in D, &D rolling a 20 on a skill check isn't considered like a critical success necessarily um I, and I consider that just lowering the DC on the skill check because I think a 20 should be 
magical whenever it's rolled. I think that number is so intrinsically wonderful when you see it on the table that to roll that for a skill check and have it not really be just like a high number, I think it robs you of that moment. So like, yeah, I, I do give some sort of benefit. Like if Grog rolled a 20 on an intelligence check a few times, and you're like, yeah. that doesn't mean he all of a sudden he has the encyclopedia in his head or that he knows exactly what he's trying to find out, but I'll give him a little bit of information he otherwise might not have known, whether it be just an instinct or something he remembered. He's like, oh yeah, you know, you can find ways to work it into a game. Um, but there have been uh, a number of encounters that have been steamrolled by a series of 20s. <laughs> you guys watched Percy's crazy 20-a-thon mm -hmm. butt flap orc death 2015. Yeah. <laughs> yep. That, that's that's going to be a bumper sticker, by the way, that whole phrase. Yeah. Um, but uh, there have been a series of social encounters in games previously where a well-placed 20 or series of 20s have led into a complete like social upheaval in a city like overthrowing uh, an individual who was in control of a, a market or uh, a political movement uh, we've had circumstances where a natural one ended up accidentally uh inciting the entire town to turn on a party oh wow um we've had a series of of unintentional 20s when you're trying to hold back <laughs> end up in the, the death of what's supposed to be just a threatened individual. Uh, uh, yeah, it's, it's led to a lot of very sticky situations. Um, but conversely, it's led to a lot of really great narrative moments. Uh, nothing really stands out in my head because we've had quite a few of them. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, mm. Scanlan and Kaylee, that, that was one of those natural ones uh, when Scanlan Scanlan's history caught up to him and she was going she was there to kill him yeah she was there to or at least at least cut him down to the point where he would understand the pain that she went through and through his speech and she rolled a straight one it was like those are those perfect narrative moments they don't work out often mm -hmm. but every now and then you get that moment where like it would be perfect if i critically succeeded or critically failed at this moment and then it happens and that's like the magic of the game for me those are the moments that you remember forever. So, yeah. We basically killed an essential NPC. Yeah. <laughs> Good job, guys. And it's a whole quest line you'll never touch again. Ones and fall out of Skyrim. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Hello. Uh, hi there. I'm Nathan. Hi, Nathan. Uh, hey, Nathan. I have no idea who you two are. I, I honestly have never heard Critical Hit before, and this uh, seems like a series I need to invest in. Hey, after this. Have, yeah. you, have you ever played D&D? Uh, I... Uh, jump right to that. About two years ago, just had a couple of friends invite me to uh, play D and D. Just after so many years of avoiding it for the social stigma that you referenced, yeah, yeah. decided to finally give it a shot. Uh, and the people who are with were amazing. Uh, just playing with them, getting to know them, and then getting to you know know their player. It really is a whole separate meta when you play it. Yeah, but. Our DM was horrendous, uh, comically so. Uh, but it really like showgirls to... bad or? Ah, <laughs> uh, we're. I we, love showgirls. He had, he had this strange tendency of wanting to constantly put us in danger, but never kill a character, uh, which it, it was a very strange kind of presentation. Yeah. But it it really speaks to kind of the uh, enjoyment of the game and the players when we played for you know twice a week for six months hating the game and just enjoying hating it uh but anyway after two years of playing you know getting new players and whatnot i'm finally gonna you know try my hand at playing you know i didn't have your magical quit and i'm just gonna start my own after two years i had a lot of good experiences good man. uh but what i wanted to ask you is you know as a starting dm i know there's going to be so much i'm going to learn and clearly got tips and tricks video i'm going to take mm -hmm. a look at but what i want to know is what major pitfall should I avoid? How should I avoid being that first DM, that absolutely terrible, that showgirls DM uh, <laughs> for, for my very first part? I would, my biggest recommendation is start small. Whenever, you, if, you're, if you're doing homebrew, if you're making your own world, start small. If you're running like a, a pre-made adventure, a module, that can be a little easier, especially for your first time because a lot of the information is already provided for you. But if you're creating your own story, um, start small. You get stuck in this world building aspect of trying to build like a whole continent to like a whole culture, multicultures and like political structure between these two sides. And all of a sudden your party's like, we're going to spend the next six months in this city. And you're like, but I built all this 
okay. <laughs> you know, so, so start in that city. You know, build, build a small town or a small uh, farm village or wherever you want them to start and just focus on fleshing out that small area. Consider the major NPCs, who, who they interact with positively and negatively. What's the, what's the antagonistic force in that area that's going to be driving the story? What type of, what type of you know, character intrigue can you input in this small little cluster of people? And then once they start playing it, their decisions will begin to inform your world building. How they interact with these people, the kind of things that their characters are interested in finding in the story, will inform you of what kind of things you can put into the world down the road that'll really hook them and get them interested in the story as they progress. So start small, have some big ideas, and take notes on things that you would like to build in the long run. But don't overwork yourself creating everything at once and have only this much be seen for a year. Um, that, that's my biggest recommendation because you, all that effort you put into a small area will make that small area so much more fleshed out and lively and real in their minds and really give you, a, the DM, the confidence of knowing that whatever they do in this little area, you have a really strong idea of where it might go and how you can react to their decisions. That's my biggest recommendation. Thank you. No worries. Okay, we have about five minutes left, so let's see if we can go really fast yeah. and get all you guys done. Cool. Okay. Hey. Uh, my name's Blake. Hey, uh, Blake. Hey. The the question I had is, what would what was like the saddest moment you've had DMing like, other than like Pike's death, you know, one of those one of those moments where you like it happened and you had to do it, but you felt bad doing like other than you know killing a player, other than killing a player, uh, killing my city of Amman. Oh. Man, building a, building a town over two and a half, three years and having it be like a central location to the story and the character's world and like where they live and everyone they love lives, you know, for the most part. And it's like the political center. And then having to, because it was the narrative I built, it's to where the world was going and where the story needed to be, come in and just smash it. Just kick all my Legos over. <laughs> but you it know. was such a cool way to do it. Oh, it was fun. Oh, such a cool it's way. Weirdly cathartic. Yeah, man. <laughs> Thank you. Welcome. In like a stomp my own sandcastles kind of way. Yeah. <laughs> ah, you <laughs> played Godzilla. Basically. To your own Tokyo. That's awesome. Hello. Hi, my name is Sean. Hey, Sean. Um, so there has been a fad going around, I'm not sure if you've heard of it, called Out of Context D&D Quotes. <laughs> oh. So this is lines from different campaigns that when taken completely out of their original setting sound hysterical. An example from a campaign that I started, thanks to you guys. No, your familiar cannot hold a spear. It is made of spaghetti. <laughs> Are there any lines like that or, or uh, moments of the show, either Critical Role or any other uh, campaign you've had that for people who may not have seen the show may really enjoy? Sure. <laughs> I'm not going to be able to quote things exactly from memory, but something along the lines of, okay, I'm going to focus on the poop in a jar. <laughs> what can I see around me? <laughs> That's one. Yep. <laughs> Critical role, ladies and gentlemen. Woo hi. Um, hi. My name is uh, Stefan. Hey, what's up, what's up? Hey, how are you? Do you play Final Fantasy? <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, yes. I have a I have a question about uh the newer game that's coming out, Final Fantasy 15. Mm -hmm. Would that one have online like an open roam like Final Fantasy 14? Mm -hmm. Oh. I don't know. Yeah. As far as I know from the game, I, I, don't, I don't think it's like multiplayer, but I, I think they're making it a little more open world, like you can wander around yeah. like the map. It's not like Final Fantasy X where, you know, you have like just, you're in an airship and you pick places and it drops you down there. I think it's a little more open world wandering. I think it's from what I've seen in the trailers. Okay. Um, but I don't, it's not multiplayer like 14 is, if that's what your question means. Oh, okay. Yeah. 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 That was my question. As far as I know. Yeah. But when I find out, I'll let you know. All right. No problem. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, buddy. Okay, quick. We only have a minute left. Uh -huh. Hi. We can, we can do this. We can do this. We did. First of all, just wanted to thank you guys for sharing what is normally such an intimate experience with everyone on behalf of everyone here and thousands of people on the internet. <laughs> That's because um, of you, man. I'm actually here with my players. Everyone in my current campaign is here today. Awesome. Wow. And I'm starting to 
run another one for some people who felt left out, and then my current players wanted to play, and all of a sudden I've got nine people and two beasts <laughs> hanging out and that I'm going to have to run combat for. So oh, I feel your pain. Yeah. <laughs> so I actually thought oh, you yeah. would be a terrific person to ask if I could get up here. What are some of the ways that you raise the bar, not just in combat, to make things challenging for that amount of people? Um, a general sliding scale I go for because if adding just more hit points means it can go on for a long time uh, for scaling. So I mean, adding more hit points does help to have enemies have longevity, especially when you have that many players. Because it's a lot of damage that can be dished out in a combat round. Uh, my recommendation is to also increase the damage that can be done by these creatures because you'll get fewer rounds of combat with more players. But to still keep it dangerous, have the damage that they take from certain attacks be large enough to the point where it really is dangerous. Or conversely, consider adding abilities to certain creatures that are, you know, area of effect attacks. You can customize any monster they come across. The monster, monster manual are just templates and suggestions of how to run these things. You can customize however you want. So if you want that beholder to be really nasty against nine players, perhaps it has an eye wipe ability that chooses to do one eye ray attack on everything within a 20 foot radius. <laughs> how will that do against nine players? You're evil. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just saying. Yeah. There, there are ways you can customize creatures to be more of a threat to multiple entities. And yeah, because a lot of single target attacks will be less effective against larger groups. Think of ways that you can give them big sweeping attacks that can hit multiple guys at once. Or things that can lock down and, uh, you know, grapple multiple, you know, players at a distance and make them ineffective for a round or two. Like, those are ways you can still make it threatening uh, for that many players without having to just, like, give them 400 more hit points and it becomes a huge slog fest. Mm. Thank you. We are out of time. Oh, one more, one more. One more, one more. Okay. Hi, guys. Hi, Hi Megan. Megan. Hi. How are you? I'm good. Good. Um, I know I'm, I'm quite, trying to be quite best I can. Um, uh, what is the biggest um, inspiring and influ influ influential of uh, Keyleth? Of Keyleth? The and Zara. Oh, what was... Most influential for your character? What was most influential for me? Um, wow. What do you think about that? You for think... Keyleth, mm. uh, I know Marisha, uh, for her it was partially Avatar The Last Airbender. Yeah. <laughs> She's a huge fan of the series. Uh, and so she created a druid. She wanted to go that, that kind of elemental trying to take and learn to master different, you know, tribes of uh, elemental types, which has been kind of a cool journey for her character. Also, because Marisha, as you may have noticed, she's like, she's a tough chick. <laughs> she She's like really confident in her sister. why I like her. You know, I'm, I'm more of the, she's the fighter, I'm the diplomat. It works out fine. <laughs> she defends my honor. Um, so for her, she wanted to choose a character that was very against type for her. She wanted to play a character that was very different than what she would normally play or who she is. And so for Keely, she wanted to make someone that was, you know, very awkward and insecure and trying to find her place in the world and uh, she's and like with any D&D character you learn a lot about yourself as you play a character and I, it's hard to not be made a better person through these experiences and so she attributes well that was her inspiration for Keyleth and Keyleth has also been an inspiration to her and she's learned to be more in touch with that aspect of herself as well so it's been that's been really inspirational for her yeah awesome. I'm, I'm, I'm much like Keyleth I'm very awkward and had a lot of self-esteem issues as well. Hey, we yeah. we all are in many ways. Yeah, I think yeah. we can all That's agree. Probably why that. we all get along so well. Yeah. Uh. For uh, Zara, I looked at all the different classes, and because again, I was brand new to this world, and I, I really looked at the group dynamic, and I thought, what's missing? What's not there? So I saw, okay, warlock, and then I was, you know, doing research online. I don't know, I should, blah, 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 but I just said, and there, and somebody posted something about, you know, badass tiefling warlock, and I said, okay, well, there's no tieflings there, so let's try that. And I found out as I went, I, and again, I, as I said before, I, I sort of started with myself in terms of the personality and the moon and everything else, and uh, someone who was, I don't know, she's, I think she's kinder and more eloquent than I am, you know, so that, that helps me, you know, because I can be sort of, I'm from Jersey, I get a little brash every now and then, so <laughs> I think she's a, a more elegant creature than I am, which is nice, you know. <laughs> 
that will still use the finger of death on Keyleth within five minutes oh. of a knockdown drag out. She, she mentioned that the other night. I was like, oh, sorry, Marisha. <laughs> but yeah, we're not here to play tiddlywinks. We're here to destroy. <laughs> thank you. All right, then. Thank you so much, guys. Thank Thanks, you. Thanks, Megan. You. Guys, Thanks, I, you guys. I'm so sorry. So sorry. If we, if we didn't get to your question... If you see us around the convention, feel free to stop us and ask yeah. or come to another panel or come to our signing and ask us or shoot me a message on Twitter. Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to a uh, signing right now. So if you want to come down, I've got some great kit bus artwork of the kill shot on Rhyme Fang. So uh, come and check it out. It's really fun. Thank you guys so much. Bye Enjoy guys. Thank you. Roll 20s.